everyone. Um, I'm Jodie. I am a nutritional therapist. Um, and it's lovely to be here and to see you all and these beautiful babies. And I'm feeling good today because I, I kind of hate to tell you this, but the heat last week, my sleep was not so great. And I, my youngest is almost two and the sleep is still being affected <laughs> by the heat. Um, so I'm feeling a bit more energized today now that it's a bit cooler. Um, shall I kick off? Shall I kind of talk about what I'm going to? Yeah, is the sound all right and everything? Everyone can hear me? Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about nutritional support for stress and anxiety um, because during pregnancy and postnatally, some women do find that they are more prone to kind of feeling the effects of stress and anxiety a bit more. And I think that um, we also need to acknowledge that you know, we're living through a pandemic, so <laughs> these things might be heightened a bit anyway at the moment. Um, but, you know, becoming pregnant and going through your pregnancy and giving birth and having your baby, these are such huge life, life changes, such huge shifts um, such immense responsibilities. Um, and, you know, our hormones, there are massive things going on with our hormones during this period. Sleep is affected. You know, if you're, if once you've given birth, you're breastfeeding, that's another, another big um, kind of physical demand on you. So there's so much going on um, that sometimes these things can increase our stress and anxiety levels. And um, there are significant demands on our bodies as well as psychologically at this time. And one of the things that I want to talk about today is how our sort of, the demands on our bodies and our increased needs for certain nutrients can really affect how we feel in terms of our mental state. And, you know, I don't want to be misleading here and say that nutrition is a cure-all for stress and anxiety, because it's definitely not, obviously, but it can have very profound uh, effects when you combine it with other strategies. So, you know, if you think about it, it combined with lifestyle practices like really focusing on sleep and um, kind of mindfulness and relaxation techniques and connection with others nutrition can can really go alongside those things and have a, a big impact um, the other thing I just want to say before I kick off is that I am not talking here about kind of extreme anxiety or um, kind of severe stress so if you feel like you're experiencing any of those things in ways that are really adversely affecting your mental health, then please do seek support. You know, speak to your midwife, speak to a GP, speak to friends and family. Um, what I'm talking about here are more the sort of normal physiological shifts, um, as well as the life shifts that can impact on our stress and anxiety levels. And if anyone has any questions at any point, um, just take yourself off mute and ask or put it in the chat if you prefer. Um, so I'll kick off. So when we are stressed, um, there are certain kind of mechanisms that happen in our bodies that can produce physical signs. And sometimes looking out for those physical signs can be an easier way of identifying how we're feeling than actually being able to notice psychologically. Because often when we're in a sort of sent in a sort of state of stress or heightened anxiety, we're so wrapped up in our heads and wrapped up in the moment that it can be quite difficult to step back from it. So there are some physical signs and symptoms that you mark up on. So the most obvious one that a lot of people feel is increased heart rate. And some people will even experience that as palpitations. So you might notice that. You might notice changes to your digestion. So this is really common. The gut brain axis is very, very powerful. So if we are in a state of heightened stress or anxiety, we might notice that we experience sort of IBS type symptoms. So you might be experiencing diarrhea or constipation. You might um, notice that you're more bloated or gassy. You might even notice reflux. So all of these things can indicate that something is something's a bit off. Back of Indy's head. Um, 
and sorry we're yeah. distracting you no i'm just i'm just sort of swooning <laughs> big chubby boy we're we're, we're muting because we're very noisy okay okay the other thing that you might notice um and i think i definitely noticed this in myself during pregnancy and posting is feeling kind of tired but wired so you might be feeling a bit jittery exhausted like really knackered but unable to stop your mind from worrying um, you might have lots of thoughts going on in your head you might desperately want to sleep but you just feel kind of a bit pumped up the other thing you might notice is cravings for certain kinds of foods and the real telltale one here is sugar cravings is anyone experiencing sugar cravings at the moment or have they done yet so really common in both pregnancy and postnatally. Um, and it's really closely linked to how our stress hormones work. So stress hormones, we have cortisol, we have adrenaline. Those are our two main stress hormones. And they play really vital functions in our body. We need them in, in kind of certain amounts. What can happen is if we're in a sort of prolonged or really heightened state of stress is that our cortisol and adrenaline levels can remain elevated for longer than is kind of normal um, and that puts us into this sort of fight or flight state this state of high alert and when our bodies are in that state we what our bodies are designed to um, keep our blood sugar levels higher and that is so that there is a sort of readily available source of energy in our blood our glucose to get into our cells so that we can move quickly we can be reactive and responsive physically to what's going around on around us and that's like totally necessary and normal so if you think about there's this the example of like having to run away from a bear in like you know olden times but i always think it's more relevant to you're crossing the road and a car appears out of nowhere and you've got to run quickly that's your cortisol and your adrenaline that are enabling you to, to react quickly to that so what can happen is that because we're in this state where our body wants our blood sugar to be higher, we crave sweet foods, we crave sugary foods, we might even be craving like really carby foods, which we break down into sugar very quickly. So, you know, you might be wanting to eat lo loads of bread or pasta or, you know, crisps or things like that. Or you might be going for like, you know, the chocolate and the sweets and, and the more obvious things. So just being aware of that and tuning into that a bit, you know, there can sometimes be other things at play here with those food cravings when we're stressed or anxious. There can be the kind of comfort food, emotional eating side of things. But if we're thinking about it just in terms of the sort of physiological things that are going on, we can support that by making sure that we're keeping our blood sugar more stable. Because it's really interesting when we are when we're burning off primarily sugar as our main energy source it actually um, makes our stress systems more hyperactive. So it means that we are more um, sensitive to certain stimuli that get us into that stress state more. So we're basically more susceptible to experiencing the physical effects of stress. Um, and the other thing that happens is that your body stores any excess um, sugar that you're not burning off as fat as well so I don't want to get into the whole weight loss thing because I'm not that's not what I'm here to talk about and I don't think it's our main priority kind of post birth but you know it's worth bearing in mind that um, that's what happens to, to sugar that we're not burning off things that you can do to support more stable blood sugar um, and to kind of help to reduce those sorts of sugar cravings are eating things that will help you to keep your blood sugar more stable so making sure that you're eating plenty of fresh fruit and veg because they provide complex carbohydrates and fiber, which helps to kind of buffer your blood sugar. Um, also, you know, whole grains where you can. So like if you want to eat a big bowl of pasta, fine, do it. Um, but maybe go for like a whole grain variety. Same with like bread and rice. Um, beans and legumes are fantastic for helping to stabilize blood sugar as our nuts and seeds. And what I would urge all of you to do is with every meal that you eat, include a, size, a portion of protein the size of your own palm. So that could be, you know, 
eggs, meat, fish, uh, poultry, eating some dairy, but then the nuts and seeds and beans and legumes, um, especially if you're combining them with whole grains, are all really good sources of protein. So that really helps to keep your blood sugar levels more stable and will help you reduce your sugar protein which can also ramp up when you're really tired. So be aware of that, you know, you, you're burning, you're using up so much energy anyway, if you're pregnant or if you're postnatal, and um, if you're breastfeeding, you need to be replenishing your, your nutrient stores and eating meals that do contain some protein and some complex carbs as well. Um, just something else to talk about in terms of sugar cravings, is caffeine. So sugar and caffeine are both kind of stimulants um, and they give us this quick release of energy. And the thing with caffeine is that it basically increases your cortisol and adrenaline levels. That's what makes you more alert. And that can become very addictive, especially postnatally, I would say. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, um, but it, you know, if you're feeling really tired, you want a kind of quick pick me up and you kind of can get to a point of craving that buzz i'm speaking for myself here but it can become quite a kind of addictive thing so the first thing to say with caffeine is that during pregnancy and then if you are breastfeeding it's recommended that you have no more than about 200 milligrams a day of caffeine and um that is i'll just read you out this is from the nhs website so you can find this on there um, an example is a mug of filter coffee is 140 milligrams, um, a mug of tea is 75 milligrams, one 50 gram plain chocolate bar is about 50 milligrams, and like a can of Coke is about 40 milligrams. So just tell, like, tell us the chocolate again, Jodie, because I know about the drinks, <laughs> but I don't, yeah, I don't know about the chocolate, and that's my problem at the moment. T tell us again. So the plain, a plain chocolate bar, which I guess they mean dark chocolate, plain chocolate, dark chocolate, um, of 50 grams is about 50 milligrams of caffeine. Okay, so just to be clear, this is 90 grams. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, chocolate is obviously not <laughs> as high in caffeine. I like that you had one to hand, because this is one I have. Um, yeah, so it does contain some caffeine. So just be aware of that. Um, if you're prone to feeling the physical effects of anxiety, especially things like palpitations, I would urge you to be very cautious with caffeine intake because it can trigger those kinds of sensations in the body, which can be quite unpleasant. And also I think, you know, when you are maybe not sleeping so much or so well, you want to be reducing um, the risk of anything that you eat or drink interfering with the sleep that you are getting. So if you do drink coffee, especially, I would say don't have anything after 2 p.m. because even if you're having it earlier in the afternoon, it can affect your sleep later that night. Now the thing, the other thing to say about coffee and sugar and the kind of relationship with them, or caffeine and sugar and the relationship between them, is that when you, after that initial buzz you get from the caffeine wears off, you can feel quite tired, you can have an energy dip, which is similar to the dip you get from after eating sugar. And then you want something else to pick you up. So even if you have had a coffee and you've been feeling quite buzzy and alert and then you have a dip, that can then trigger the sugar cravings. So the two can be quite linked. So I think just just tune in and be aware of it if you're feeling any of those things. If you notice that you have tendencies um, to use those things as crutches. Um, okay, so I talked a bit about protein. The other thing to, to remember with protein is that proteins are made up of these little amino acids. And there's one amino acid that's particularly important for uh, feeling good serotonin, your feel-good neuro neurotransmitter, and also melatonin, which is your sleep hormone. And the name of that amino acid is L-tryptophan. And, you know, L-tryptophan is, it, so it's the precursor to serotonin and melatonin. So most of it is actually um, 
most serotonin is produced in our gut. So we want to make sure that our gut health is good and, you know, that we're eating plenty of fibre um, to produce prebiotic to feed the bacteria in our guts. But also, you know, we can get L-tryptophan from loads of different foods. So it is plentiful in oats and almonds. Um, bananas are really good sources of it. Um, nut butter, so things like peanuts and almonds. Um, but the, the kind of famous amazing source of L-tryptophan is turkey. But, you know, unless you're kind of eating handfuls of turkey, you might not be getting <laughs> getting it primarily from that. But, you know, it's in loads of food. So, you know, even if you, if you feel like you want a snack in the evening after dinner, if you're, you know, if you're feeling really hungry, if you're breastfeeding, if you're pregnant and you're feeling hungry, having something like an oat cake with some banana on it or with, or with some almond butter or peanut butter on it that's a really good choice because it will just help bump up those levels a bit and the other thing you can do to promote your um, serotonin and your melatonin levels is getting out into the daylight every day and um, that actually you know especially in terms of melatonin our eyes the light that we receive through our eyes um, signals to our body when we need to be awake and then when it's dark that signals to our bodies that it's time to sleep. It doesn't quite work for your babies in the same way, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, it's important for us in terms of regulating our circadian rhythm. Um, something else I wanted to say about um, supporting our ability, our resilience to stress and anxiety is the importance of, of being outdoors in wide open green space. So there's this piece of research that was done that shows that if you are in a kind of wide open green space, there are so, sort of signals that your visual perception, um, your peripheral vision that sends to your brain that you're in a low threat environment. And it helps your body to actually dial down its cortisol response in those situations. Yeah, it's really interesting. If you compare being kind of like in a big field and how you feel there to how you would feel walking down a crowded, busy city street where you've got people walking towards you, you've got big buildings up ahead, you've got lots of obstacles at street level, you've got cars whipping past, you're on a higher alert. You have to be in higher alert because, you know, you have to be more aware of what's going on around you. Whereas if you're in green open space, things are much calmer and, you know, you probably feel more relaxed. So, if you can get out for a walk for like at least 30 minutes every day in bright daylight, um, that is, that's a really good thing for dialing down your body's stress response. Um, I wanted to just say something about some other sort of key nutrients now. So I've talked a bit about protein. The other thing to be really aware of is fats in your diet. So um, our brain is composed primarily of fat. And there is a type of fat that's particularly rich in our brain tissue called DHA, and that is a form of omega-3 fat. So one thing to bear in mind is that when you're pregnant, you're, you're, when you're pregnant, you are providing all the nutrients that your baby needs from your body. So, you know, it's just worth remembering that whether or not you're eating enough of the foods that contain those particular nutrients, your body, your baby will take them from your body stores. Okay, your your baby will always get what it needs from you, unless you're like very severely malnourished. So you don't need to worry about that. But what you do need to be aware of is that you don't want to become depleted in those nutrients from your own stores. And you know this is something that can happen in pregnancy, and it can happen postnatally if you're breastfeeding because you know, your, your baby's taking what it needs from you. Breast milk is particularly rich in DHA as well. So baby will get all of this, these brain nourishing fats from your breast milk, but you might become a bit low in them if you're not getting enough in your diet. So eating the, the kind of the best sources of these DHA fats are oily fish in your diet. So, um, you know, if you can eat two portions, two kind of palm sized portions a week of oily fish, that, that's fantastic. So those are things like salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring, and trout. Um, if you don't eat fish, that's fine. You can um, look at an algae oil supplement that's, that's high in DHA. Get a really good quality one. Check how it is um, purified. And, and, you know, most of the 
brands will have like a access to like a report on there so you can see how they're how they're purified um or you can eat walnuts um chia seeds and flax seeds or have moderate levels in they're not as readily available as fish but if you're taking an algae oil you'll be getting good levels um and that is really good for your brain health as well as your baby's brain health. And there have been some studies that evidence isn't completely conclusive, but to show that um, good levels of, it's been done with supplementation, levels of omega-3 um, can actually help to reduce postnatal anxiety. So that's, that's worth bearing in mind. Um, the other thing is that low DHA in your brain is one of the things that's been linked to that kind of baby brain sort of brain fog type feeling. So if you're feeling that, think omega-3 DHA fats um, and try and get them in your diet or through supplementation. Nothingfishy.co from Juliet. Yeah, so that's the supplement. Do you take those ones too, Nissa? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was just saying, yeah, but thinking they're really great. So I thought I'd just share it. Brilliant, that's great, thank you. There's another brand called um, Vegetology. Um, that do oh, what's it? it's called Opti Three. They're ones that I've um, used and recommended before as well. So there are yeah, there there are an increasing number of these algae oil supplements on the market now that are good quality ones. And there's one called Norsan as well that comes as an oil that you can put on. You can use it as a salad dressing oil as well. Um, so that's the omega-3 fats. And then also just other fats in your diet. You want to be having things like olive oil and, um, you know, coconut oil in moderation. A bit of butter is fine. Um, so all these things are good. You want fats in your diet. They help stabilize your blood sugar. They're good for your hormones. They are they're good for a whole host of things. Every cell in your body is surrounded by a layer of fat to protect it. We, we, need, we need fat. Okay, so don't be afraid of fat. Um, another really important nutrient for sort of stress and anxiety is magnesium. So magnesium plays a whole bunch of roles in the body. I think it's got over 300 functions that it, that it fulfills. So it supports energy production within our cells. It helps our muscles and nerves to function properly. Um, it increases melatonin, that sleep hormone production. It improves the release of certain neurotransmitters. It helps to stabilize our blood sugar. Um, and it also is known in geeky nutrition terms as nature's tranquilizer because it's very relaxing and soothing. So it's great for muscle tension. And also just if you're feeling wound up, magnesium is something that can really help to reduce that. So primarily you wanna be thinking about your diet here. So dark green leafy vegetables, things like spinach and chard, kale, broccoli, all of those are fantastic for magnesium, whole grains, nuts and seeds, beans and legumes, fish, and yogurt is also quite a good source of magnesium. Sometimes we need a bit more. Um, we don't quite manage to get enough through diet. So um, also during pregnancy and breastfeeding, your, your requirements for magnesium do increase a bit. So you might want to look at supplementation, um, but one of the really easy ways that you can increase magnesium is through Epsom salt baths and um, yeah, or foot baths if you don't, if you're not really feeling like taking a bath at the moment. So you pour like one to two cups of Epsom salts in a bath and soak for around 20 minutes and you can absorb the, the magnesium from the salts in your skin. Obviously, if you're pregnant, you don't want to be having super hot baths, um, just comfortably warm. Um, but I just think they're, they're great. The baths in themselves are a great way of relaxing, but also, you know, the added magnesium is quite therapeutic. Um, you know, when we're stressed, we excrete, we use up and excrete more magnesium than usual. So it becomes something that we can be get a bit depleted in if we're in kind of like a prolonged period of stress. Um, and then the other key nutrient is vitamin C. So the highest concentration of vitamin C in our bodies is in our adrenal glands, which is where we produce our stress hormones. And again, we use up a lot of vitamin C uh, when we're stressed or anxious. Vitamin C is just so important generally um, for our immunity, obviously, um, but also it's a really powerful antioxidant and it's important for um, collagen synthesis 
photosynthesis, so postnatal healing, vitamin C is really important as well to kind of help tissues repair. Um, and you know, vitamin C you get, everyone always thinks citrus fruit because it's the obvious one and citrus fruits are great sources of vitamin C, but you can also get it from those dark green leafy vegetables. Sort of any brightly coloured fruit or vegetable will contain some vitamin C, but you know, the, the ones that are really particularly high are things like kiwi and papaya, sweet potatoes are good sources, uh, tomatoes, you're, you know, just eat, eating as much fruit and veg as you can is, is good for your vitamin C intake. Um, and then we've kind of touched on this already, uh, but sleep. <laughs> When we sleep, we're regenerating and repairing. And while stress and anxiety can affect our sleep and, and our ability to sleep well, um, it is the best thing that we can do to actually help our bodies to, to cope with the effects of stress. So really just prioritizing it where you can. I think, you know, I was looking at Nissa's post before on Instagram and you said that you'd had a nap. And I was thinking, yes, that when baby sleeps, sleep and I remember people saying it to me when after I'd had my oldest and I just didn't quite get it but because there's always stuff to do and it's an opportunity to try and clean up or you know reply to emails or whatever but really really do just try and use that time to get some rest yourself um try and prioritize going to bed earlier um be a bit mindful in the evenings I think of watching anything that's too stimulating, anything that's going to kind of rile you up or, you know, I would say avoid the news in the evenings, avoid anything that's too kind of really suspense or action-y on TV because they basically increase your body stress response. They get your cortisol and adrenaline going. Um, try and, this is, this is a tricky one, but I would say, you know, if you are having trouble sleeping or if you are awake feeding in the night, really try to limit ideally avoid picking up your phone and um, those night scrolls because the blue light from your phone will uh inhibit your melatonin production your sleep hormone but also you know it's just that stimulation is is not great for helping you to sleep um, I, to I totally relate to that one you know the nights when i resist and i don't look at my phone at all i go back to sleep so much quicker and then if I start looking, you know, and it's a rabbit hole, we all know, then I can be awake, like in these back to sleep. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm awake. Ah, it makes such a difference. I know. I remember doing things like, you know, just getting caught up and looking at baby stuff that I needed to get and like placing orders at three in the morning. And you're like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it definitely, um, yes, it's a tricky one, but it, it has a big impact. Um, and then I think, you know, in terms of stress reduction, things like listening to your hypnobirthing recordings, trying to do some kind of relax, listening to some relaxation stuff, some meditation, even using some acupressure on yourself can be really effective. Anything that's just going to help you to dial down stress. You know, we've all got things that work for us better individually and, you know, find out if you don't already kind of know instinctively what yours are, just do some, some experimentation and find what works for you. And also just in terms of re reducing stress, things that get you into a kind of um, playful, uninhibited state are great. So things like laughing and playing and dancing and being silly and having lots of cuddles to get your oxytocin going, all of those things are brilliant at, at relieving stress. So build them in, you know, find joy where you can, be outside, uh, just try it try and, and find things that make you feel kind of at peace and relaxed um, does anybody have any questions I do but I'm gonna wait to see if anyone else wants to ask anything first mine is like completely about my life so I'm gonna <laughs> and guys we haven't got Jodie for very long I know she has to go in about 10 minutes because she has a client book so if you do have questions, fire away. Anything nutritional? I've got one. Um, it's, I don't know if it's slightly off topic, but anything that you would recommend um, for breastfeeding mums like to stimulate milk production? 
anything. I know there sort of seems like there's a lot of options, but none massively evidence based. I don't know if there's anything that you've seen work a lot of okay. people. So it's an interesting one. I think I think the main things that I'm I mean I think stress and anxiety are related to this. Actually I don't think it's completely off topic. I think it's <laughs> it's actually quite linked. So the basic things like making sure that you're well hydrated is really important. Um, so keeping water nearby and just making sure that you are drinking continuously throughout the day. Um, eating enough. So making sure that you really are getting enough kind of nutrition in and that you're not under eating, which is very easy to do, I think, because it can be quite difficult to cook and quite difficult to find time to eat sometimes. Um, but really do prioritise that. And then in terms of certain foods, so yeah, there's no, so I would say that the kind of, these are more sort of traditional remedies. Um, some of them can be very effective. Oats, um, oatmeal is good. Um, fennel, cooking with fennel seeds or using fresh scent fennel. Um, i trying to remember the other ones off the top of my head. Fenugreek is meant to be quite good, I think. Yes. Is it? Yeah, fenugreek. Um, whole grains generally are good. So, you know, <coughs> to, to try and include whole grains, that they are uh, supposed to be good for milk production. And I think barley can be quite helpful as well. Okay. I mean, yeah, I would, I would kind of, there's also some like, Pucker do quite a nice breastfeeding tea that contains some of those herbs. Yeah, I've actually got some of that. <laughs> yeah, I think just it's really tasty as well. Yeah, it's really nice that tea, and I think it's it's good as well for just keeping you well hydrated as well. You know, just but yeah, yeah I think with those sorts of galactagog, those herbs that you know, there's a lot of stuff on the market that claims to uh, help to promote breastfeeding, and I would be a little bit cautious and wary of it I think that those like fenugreek and fennel oats yeah I'd say give them a go but I wouldn't um I think staying hydrated and well fed are the ones yeah I prioritize there thanks okay um I've got a question as well um it's um about sugar <laughs> sugar cravings so I'm just wondering, you know, you put a limit to the caffeine intake one can have. Is there a limit to how much sugar one can have? Not really. Not unless you're on like a medically prescribed diet for like gestational diabetes or something. No. Um, what I would say is as much as you can, if you can try and go for the non-refined sugars. So like if you're craving something sweet, you know, well, firstly, if you're going to have chocolate, I would say go for dark chocolate mm -hmm. because it is higher in caffeine, but it's lower in sugar because there's more co cocoa in there to crowd out the sugar. Um, but, you know, if you if you fancy something sweet, maybe try going for dates. You can mix them with some nut butter. That's really nice. And if you put those in the freezer, they're amazing. They kind of taste like a Snickers. Like <laughs> you can make energy balls. Um there, you know, there's lots of things that you can do to kind of get those those kind of fixes elsewhere. But no, there's not really a limit. I mean, I would say this isn't really the time to be overly restrictive unless there's a medical reason to. But I would also say that it's really useful to just try and recognise how those foods make you feel mm. and use that as your gauge. You know, pregnancy, you're naturally in a kind of more insulin resistant state, which means that you, the body does want more glucose because the baby needs glucose for energy. So, you know, those sugar cravings can be quite overpowering during pregnancy. And I think trying to completely restrict isn't necessarily realistic, or it could cause you even more stress, frankly, you know, getting into a thing of feeling that you're that you're failing at doing something so I I would say just try where you can to go for the more natural options and um to just make sure that you're having the protein with each meal because that really will help making sure you're getting enough protein it will help with those cravings 
I think, you know what, that kind of answered my question. So thank you, Anna. That was like kind of, so I'm three months postnatal, been eating really like well, really nutritious, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner, which is great for the breastfeeding. Um, but do you know what, Jodie, I've really slipped into the sugar thing as well. Like we're having dessert, put like proper sugary pudding every night mm. after dinner. And like sometimes in the day, I'll grab the chocolate. So I'm, I've noticed that despite the good nutrition, which is brilliant, I definitely slipped into like some proper sugary habits. I think some of the stuff you said there would be quite helpful. The energy balls. Yeah. Um something else that can work quite well is cinnamon so it contains chromium which is a mineral that actually helps to it supports a healthy insulin response so if when you're craving something sweet try having a cup of cinnamon tea and uh -huh. add cinnamon to you know if you're making smoothies or energy balls or anything like that then then add some cinnamon to it because it can it gives you that sweet flavor but it also helps to improve your insulin response so that's nice that's a top tip i like what you said just now about some nut butter on an oat cake because i could do that after a meal with yeah. some cinnamon that's a top one yeah i think it's um it's just finding those those little tweaks like i i made this nice cream the other day which is just use frozen bananas and put them in the blender and add i added like a bit of vanilla essence and it was absolutely delicious um and mm. it tasted like ice cream so you get that kind of that hit but it's not as it's not going to have as dramatic effect on your blood sugar as you know that's a top one i like that uh, maybe i need to do a little bit of looking for some slightly more healthy um alternatives yeah. that sounds good that sounds good i think we've 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 used up all your time my love you need to go right I do need to dash, yeah. Sorry. So before you go, tell everybody where they can find you, your website, your Instagram. Um, you, I know you're offering something awesome at the moment. Just let everybody know so that, you know, it's good. Okay. So my website is jodieabrahams.com. My Instagram is underscore jodieabrahams. I've got two online programs at the moment. One is a four-week um, self-directed study um, program called Grounding Gently which is all, a, a lot of it is around reducing stress and anxiety, but it also covers hormonal balance and um, your relationship with food. Um, so that is, you can find the link to that on my website. And I've also got a seven day sugar reset, which <laughs> I suppose I'd actually recommend kind of when you're right in the postnatal thing, maybe give it a while, but I run it quite regularly. Um, and it's basically a meal plan. So it's loads of recipes, a meal plan, um, and you get some daily support emails and two calls with me. So if you're interested in that, check it out on my website. Um, yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, love. That was all. That was great. My pleasure. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Thank you.